My name is Anne Grimes Rand. I'm president of the museum. And thank you for coming out on a cool evening. We hope you can warm up a bit while we enjoy our talk this evening to hear a wonderful talk about John Haley Bellamy's beautiful eagles that we are all so familiar with. And we're pleased that we have author James Craig this evening to join us here from Gloucester. He's a graduate of the University of Massachusetts with a degree in anthropology. And he began his curatorial career at the House of Seven Gables, serving as associate curator for collections at the Cape Ann Historical Museum from 2003 to 2007, and is currently an independent consultant to fine art collectors, antique dealers, and museums. And he is the author of Frank Finding Smith, Maritime Painting in the 20th Century, as well as Fitz H. I'm not sure if it was Henry or Hugh at the time. Well, we kept it that <laughs> An Artist's Voyage Through the 19th Century America, which was awarded the Gloucester Historical Commission's Preservation Award in 2007. But he's here this evening to talk about his latest book, American Eagle, The Bull Art and Brash Life of John Hel Haley Bellamy, which is available tonight in our museum store. And I'm sure if you'd like it signed, that's possible. So without further ado, let me turn it over to you. Good. How are we all doing today? Is everybody enjoying this beautiful, balmy New England weather? Before we begin, where is everybody from out of curiosity? I know we have some folks here from Charlestown, from the Navy Yard. Where else do we have folks from? Any? Far away exotic Melrose. Okay. And um, any folks? No? Nobody else wants to volunteer? Somerville. Somerville. Okay, Somerville. Concord. Concord. Well, I knew that. Pardon? Groton. Groton. Okay, wow. Well, <laughs> that doesn't really count. Then. Well, I just want to start things off, first of all, by thanking you all for braving this um, horrible cold to go ahead and come on out to hear a little talk about a man that many, myself included, would consider to be America's greatest woodcarver, most of this with John Haley Bellamy. Uh, I won't take up too much of your time tonight. Talk to everyone about a good 40, 45 minutes or so. We're going to talk about just who this uh, Mr. Bellamy was, uh, the whole business behind him and his eagles. And um, after I'm done with my little spiel, go ahead and open up the floor to any questions that you may have. And, um, and also, we're also going to, because we're here at the Constitution Museum tonight, we're going to talk about um, the role the Constitution actually played in Bellamy's career as a woodcarver. Um, a lot of folks don't realize this stuff, but um, in many ways, you could make the argument that if it wasn't for the Constitution, we probably wouldn't be talking about Bellamy here tonight. <laughs> So buckle in your seat, your seat belts and uh, enjoy the ride. Um, without further ado, shall we begin? Okay. Do begin, Mr. John Haley Bellamy. Uh, yeah, that light's kind of getting in the way, isn't it? Well, um, our hero story begins on April 16th in the year 1836 in the town of Kittery, Maine. Kittery is the southernmost township in the state of Maine. Um, you can find it right across the Piscataqua River from Portsmouth, New Hampshire. John here had the good fortune to be born into a household that enjoyed a large degree of wealth and prosperity in 19th century Kittery. Uh, his mom, Frances Keene Bellamy, or Fanny as she was known to family and friends, was typical of the time that she was a homemaker. Um, she and her husband Charles would bring into this world no less than 10, yes count them, 10 kids, of which John was their firstborn. She also mentioned she had two um, other kids from her first husband too. So she's hardy Yankee stock, to say the least. As far as the wealth of the family, it comes from this man right here. This is the Honorable Charles Garrish Bellamy. Um, Chuck here was, um, he was a dynamo in 19th century Maine politics. Um, he served in a dizzying array of public offices, everything from uh, captain of the state militia and justice of the peace, all the way up to being a state rep, a state senator, um, a signer of the Ashburton Treaty with Great Britain, um, the real pinnacle of his career would come when uh, he came within one vote of gaining uh, the Democratic nomination to run for U.S. Senate from Maine. So we have in our hands here a very wealthy, very powerful, very connected man. Um, the Bellamy clan lives in this house right here in uh, the, the village of Kittery Point, which is a neighborhood of Kittery. Uh, we could do an entire talk on this house alone. This is the Sir William Pepperell Mansion. Uh, many an historic personage lived in this house before the Bellamy's ever came along. Uh, this house would actually play a crucial role in sending Bellamy along the path of becoming a great woodcarver. First you have what's going on inside the house. Uh, room after room in the Pepperell Mansion is replete 
with all of this beautiful, um, very austere yet elegant wood carving from the early to mid 1700s. Like shell cupboards like you see here, um, chamber after chamber is just um, cloaked in this beautiful wainscoting that goes from floor to ceiling. And then there's the grand central staircase with, in the front hall, which architects as late as the 1920s were going ahead and um, going into to photograph and to measure so they could replicate its design in buildings that they were constructing. So you can imagine the effect this is having on Bellamy, growing up in this house that's full of all the superlative woodcraft from the uh, 1700s, and how this is going to affect his uh, sense of aesthetic and his artistic sensibilities. But even more important than what's going on in the Pepper Mansion is what's happening down the street. Um, just a stone's throw away from Bellamy's front door is, of all things, the Portsmouth Navy Yard. Um, this is the major employer in Kittery at that time, still a major employer today. This is where many of America's warships are being uh, built and, and uh, repaired. Of course, those vessels are made out of wood. So thus, Bellamy is growing in the very, up in the very heart of a vibrant shipbuilding community. All of his neighbors are you know, everything from sawyers to carpenters to boat builders to naval architects. Uh, so you can imagine what, what effect this is going to have on him. It's no wonder that Bellamy is going to, when he comes of age, become uh, a decorative ship carver himself. Uh, for a long time, we used to be under the impression that Bellamy's uh, wood carving career started with a man named Laban Beecher. Uh, Laban Beecher, to those who especially work here at Const the Constitution Museum, will instantly recognize that name. Laban Beecher was a decorative wood carver who did a lot of work for the U.S. Navy, um, including, of course, the famous Andrew Jackson figurehead of the Constitution. Uh, Laban Beecher, like Bellamy, uh, made a, uh, the, the cornerstone of his career actually making these carvings of decorative eagles. He appears to have been possibly a friend of Charles Gerrish Bellamy, John's dad. And we know that in 1857, Bellamy was um, briefly working in Beecher's workshop down here in Boston. And we know that Bellamy was intimately acquainted with Beecher's craft due to this particular bird right here. This is a Beecher carving, and it used to live right above the front door to the Bellamy mansion. So, Scholars in the past, they kind of did the, um, they were kind of lazy. They said, where there's smoke, there's fire. Obviously, this Beecher character must have trained Bellamy. Truth is, these two guys probably never met. Um, Beecher, in 1857, had already sold his shop down here in Boston. And he had moved west to engage in lumber and land speculation. Um, as to who actually, and I should say also, it doesn't make much sense that that's when Bellamy gained his uh, instruction because Bellamy was only there for a few months before the economic depression of 1857 caused him to lose his job there. And it didn't make much sense because Bellamy was 21 years old, kind of late to start your training in wood carving. Um, so who did train Bellamy? Well, when you roll up your sleeves and do your research, you quickly discover that there are two men who actually share the honor. The first is this guy right here, John's dad. Long before he ever went into politics, Charles Gerrish Bellamy was, of all things, a master woodcarver. Uh, this man had studied civil architecture engineering down here in Boston. There's many a, um, a home still standing in the Kittery Portsmouth area today that this man actually built. Did lots of interior and decorative uh, exterior wood carving on homes. And um, very tellingly, he also ran the boat building shops at both the Portsmouth and right here at the Charlestown Navy Yards. He was also the U.S. Inspector of Timber at those two facilities. So this is the man who pours the foundation. He's going to go ahead and give Bellamy that early introduction into um, wood carving and uh, show him the ropes, teach him about the properties of wood and, and how to use the various woods for different tasks and duties. He's the one who gets the ball rolling. Truth is, John is actually growing up in a household full of wood carvers. Not only is his dad a master wood carver, but so are John's two younger brothers, Charles Jr. and Elisha. Um, but the time would come when John needed to um, gain a more formal apprenticeship. Uh, his father can only go ahead and train him so much given that he has a busy political career and he's also running back and forth between Portsmouth and Charlestown. So it's here that we find this handsome devil coming on the scene. Uh, this man right here is Mr. Samuel Dockham. Um, a lot of folks are like, well, who's Sam Dockham? Well, it's a real shame that we don't know that name today because Back in the 1830s or 40s or 50s, uh, probably a lot of us would have known that name. Sam Dockham was, of course, a carver and cabinet maker. He was the carver and cabinet maker in the Portsmouth area. 
His work is being exported far beyond that region. Um, he could do anything. He could carve anything from a decorative uh, coffin lid or boot form all the way up to elegant Grecian couches. He, like John's dad, does lots of interior and exterior decorative carving in homes. And um, very tellingly, he also does lots of interior and exterior decorative wood carving on the clipper ships that are being built in Portsmouth at that time. So this is the man that takes the raw talent of John Haley Bellamy. He's going to sh shape him and hone him into this amazing artist that we know him to be today. Bellamy's apprenticeship with Dockham lasts from 1851 to 1857. Then after two years where Bellamy, due to some personal problems, is out of town, we next see him coming on the scene in 1859 when he opens up his first workshop. And you'll notice it's right at 17 Daniel Street, Portsmouth, the same address where Dockham was working out of. So it shows how close these two men had become during that time. Um, and you can also see, just from reading this business card, Bellamy, by 1859, is already a master woodcarver. There's nothing he can't do. So Dockham's instruction has done him quite well. As to what kind of woodcarving Bellamy's doing the most of, well, of all the things he offers here, it's actually ship carving that he's going to do the most often. Proof of that is found in this carving right here. This is one of my favorites by Bellamy. If ever you could call a wood carving cuddly, it would have to be this one. Uh, what we have here is uh, a piece that was made in January of 1859, right in the workshop. It has an airtight provenance. And uh, what this is is a decorative device called a cat head. Uh, cat heads are found on the ends of the booms on ships, like the Constitution of all things, that raise and lower a ship's anchor. So, and you will notice there's a slight similarity between this one and Bellamy's. Makes you wonder. Um, but this is just one of the carvings he's doing there at the shop. We have further confirmation that he's working primarily as a ship carver, given the Portsmouth Journal, which in June of that same year runs this lovely little article on Bellamy. And you notice the first thing they mention right here, Mr. John H. Bellamy, ship furniture, sign and frame carver. So they put that first and foremost. Then we have this priceless testimony. The heads of the Indian and of the ox are well executed. But the bust of a female is a superior specimen of good workmanship. <laughs> Obviously written by a man. <laughs> so those heads are ship's figureheads. Um, this is priceless testimony. Again, it confirms that he's primarily working as a ship carver. But also, it tells us about other figureheads that he crafted. Because up until now, we were only aware of one figurehead ever. That was the figurehead for the USS Lancaster, which we'll see in a moment. Um, so Bellamy is working there at Portsmouth at 17 Daniel Street, but he's only there until the autumn of that year. Um, by autumn of 1859, he is relocated down here to Boston, particularly to East Boston and uh, Medford, Massachusetts. The reason for this is because, well, he's following the money. This is where the work is. Um, Boston, East Boston and Medford are the twin uh, shipbuilding epicenter of New England, of really the Northeast. Only New York can really compete with this area. This is where all the great naval architects are working, like Samuel Pook, the immortal Donald McKay. So Bellamy is here because that's where the work is. One out of every four decorative ship carvers alone was working in Medford at this time. Um, at least I should say decorative ship carvers from New England. Um, Bellamy is going to be working uh, down this area until the coming of the American Civil War. And when war breaks out, we find Bellamy working out of all places, right here at the Charlestown Navy Yard. Yeah, he goes and he makes the jump from commercial to military ship carving. And uh, this is the beginning of a lifelong association between Bellamy and the Navy. Uh, he's going to be here from 18, he's going to work for the, for the Navy from 1861 all the way to around the time of the Spanish American War, circa 1898, 1900, maybe even possibly a little later than that. What kind of work is he doing for the Navy? Well, first of all, he's making ship's figureheads, uh, including this monster right here. Uh, this is Bellamy's magnum opus, his, uh, his paste de resistance, if you will. This is the figurehead for the USS Lancaster. 18-foot uh, wingspan, over 3,000 pounds of gilded pine, widely considered to be uh, the greatest figurehead in the American ship carving tradition and one of the finest in the world. It's a feat of engineering as much as it is um, a work of art. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it, but had the winds of history blown just a little different, this figurehead would be here. Today, it's down at the, in Newport News, Virginia, at the Mariner's Museum. 
Originally, though, it was in, in the 1920s when the Lancaster was um, being scrapped. They took this figurehead off the Lancaster, and she was actually right here at the Navy Yard in the chain park because there was an admiral running, oh, not an admiral, I'm sorry, commandant who was running uh, the, the facility here who envisioned having a museum dedicated to telling the story of the Constitution and the, and the story of the American Navy and of the Navy Yard itself. And this was going to be the crown gem that first greeted you when you walked in the door. Unfortunately, Congress pulled the funding, and lo and behold, the eagle ended up instead in a junk shop over on State Street. And from that chandlery, she was purchased and ended up down in uh, Virginia. So how close y'all came to having this right here <laughs> in your own lobby. Uh, gotta love Congress. Um, another thing Bellamy is doing lots of uh, carvings of are these items. Um, these are called gangway boards. These are decorative plaques that would line the sides of a ship's gangway. Uh, this was actually a specialty of his. He did a lot of these carvings. And um, another thing he did was stern board uh, designs. This is the USS Wabash. Um, the stern board that we have here uh, was carved by Bellamy right here at the Navy Yard back in 1871. Everything you see here, the shield, the delicate filigree, the star, even these geometric patterns around the windows, all Bellamy's handiwork, a previously undocumented carving by him. And uh, I had to mention this. I wish I had a nickel every time someone asked me if Bellamy did the stern board for the Constitution. And uh, the answer is an emphatic no. It's a very nice, very cute little eagle. But um, please, your homework tonight when we're done here is to go home, get on the phone, call your friends and family. Please tell them this is not Bellamy. Because I keep getting this question from folks. Um, but another thing that Bellamy did do was lots of decorative interior wood carving, particularly in officers' quarters. Um, officers' quarters in the Victorian era were pretty, pretty swanky digs. Um, these were very sumptuously furnished quarters. This is the captain's cabin of the USS Vandalia. And everything you see here, the chairs, the tables, bureaus, desks, all the, uh, the bookcases here, even the wainscoting, this all required the work of decorative ship carvers like Bellamy. So this is something he's also doing quite regularly. Um, Bellamy is working full time for the Navy during the Civil War. But when the war ends, congressional budget cuts gut the Navy's budget. And uh, as a consequence, we find that most Navy Yard workers here at Charlestown get their pink slips. But John, as a testimony to his capabilities, as well as I'm sure some of his political connections, his dad did run the boat shop, uh, John ends up keeping his job. But he's only going to work from now on on a part-time basis. From now until the time he finally retires from the Navy, he's just working on a project-by-project -project basis. So He's going to be working on something for a few weeks or a few months, and then when that's over, well, he's going to be out of work for a few weeks or a few months. So in order to fill the gaps in his resume, in 1866, John partners up with a uh, fellow Navy Yard worker named David Titcomb, and together they make Titcomb and Bellamy manufacturers of emblematic frames and brackets. Uh, they're off, oh, Bellamy's uh, workshop, you can see, is right here in Charlestown outside the gate at 11 City Square. It's actually on the first floor of a Masonic Lodge, is where he's working out of. Um, Bellamy is, of course, the designer. He's coming up with all these different emblematic frame designs and overseeing their manufacture. Uh, Titcomb, he's kind of the brains of the operation. He's overseeing a small army of business agents that are going door to door across the country peddling these designs. So, what kind of designs are they making? What are these emblematic frames and brackets? Well, in the post-Civil War era, there is an enormous interest in, of all things, fraternal organizations and secret societies, uh, particularly the Masons. So uh, lodges are popping up all over the country. Thousands of men are joining these lodges every week. So they see a market. And what Bellamy starts to do is he designs at least a dozen of these different frames that are just replete with all these Masonic symbols and sigils. Uh, these were very popular. Individual Masons are buying them so they could display their um, certificates of membership in the home. We also see lodges purchasing them so they could go ahead and display their charters. It's not just frames, though. Uh, Tickhome and Bellamy are also manufacturing these clock cases, again, stuffed with all the Masonic symbols. And then one of my favorites, these uh, decorative whatnot shelves, which could be used to display anything from tchotchkes and knickknacks in the home all the way to in the lodge, they could be used to display ceremonial regalia and what have you. This is good business for Bellamy. Uh, by 1869, they're already selling these items in a dozen states. They have agents everywhere from as far north as Vermont to as far south as Florida. 
and as far west as Mississippi. Um, it's good cash, but yet by 1872, we see that John sells his interest in the business and returns to Portsmouth. Now, previous scholars they had some rather disparaging theories as to why Bellamy did this. They really couldn't figure it out. Um, the reality is there are actually three very cogent reasons why Bellamy returns. The first is that in 1872, the patents expired on those frames and clock cases. So now anybody who wants to can make a knockoff of them, and people are doing that. So the market is getting flooded. There's really no money in it for Bellamy anymore. The second reason is very personal. His parents are getting older. They need to be taken care of, particularly his father, who in that year declares bankruptcy. So John comes back with a big barrel full of money from his time down here in Charlestown and bails out the family. He proceeds to go ahead and to take charge of the finances and gets everything fixed. And the third reason is that there's a new industry in the Portsmouth Kittery area. An industry that if John plays his cards right, promises him virtually unlimited returns. It's something that you know, can give him a lot more money than he ever could make doing all these Masonic carvings. Uh, that industry is, of all things, tourism. In the early 1870s, tourists have discovered the Kittery Portsmouth area. They're going up there in droves to go ahead and spend not a week or two, but the entire summer in these very large hotels, such as the Appledore, the Champerdown, the Oceanic House. So John sees a target-rich environment. Wealthy Bostonians, New Yorkers, Baltimoreans, Philadelphians, uh, as well as wealthy Canadians coming down from Toronto and Ontario, they're all flocking to the region. It's a wealthy crowd, a wealthy clientele. They also have lots of disposable income, and they're bored to tears, <laughs> sitting out here in these big hotels, playing tennis and just trying to get, breathe in the salt air. It's kind of a recuperative place to go. So this is a perfect opportunity. It's also a great way to get rid of the middleman. He doesn't need Titcomb and that army of business agents going door to door across the country anymore. By relocating up there in Portsmouth, now he has the entire country coming right to him. So he's going to get rid of the middleman, more profit for him. But what kind of carvings is he going to do? After all this Masonic stuff, the patents have expired, the market's flooded, there's no money in it anymore. Well, John has seized upon a new emblem, at least new for him, which is enjoying a lot of popularity at that time. And that is, of course, the American Eagle. It's the early 1870s. The Civil War is over, the Union has been restored, the healing has begun. America is in the midst of an unprecedented economic boom. We're seeing the emergence of a true middle class. This is a period of enormous optimism and pride and hope, as well as patriotism and even burgeoning nationalism, as America is starting to get the first stirrings of, of itself as a global power, for real. So this, in the midst of this optimistic era, when all this money is to be made, the American Eagle is experiencing a resurgence of its own as a national symbol. Its folks are rallying to it. And so Bellamy sees the opportunity. This is one of the first two carvings he made when he got back uh, to Portsmouth in September of 1872. And this bird and its twin ended up, out of all places, dwelling on top of the roof line of the Appledore Hotel. So you have very conspicuous public display here. All those wealthy tourists, every day they come in and out of the hotel, they get to look at Bellamy's handiwork front and center. And that's not a coincidence. Um, Bellamy is doing this in a lot of places. He's making a lot of these eagle plaques, like this monster right here, which is 10 feet in width. It's absolutely beautiful to behold. And he's making a lot of these. And they're ending up in very public places as well. We're finding there, there's a 16-foot eagle right on top of the, um, the, over the door at the Portsmouth City Hall. Uh, the Newfields uh, New Hampshire Town Hall, they very recently had one of their eagles over the portico. They recently brought it in and get it out of the weather. So now it's finally under glass. So they're showing up at town halls and city halls. They're also showing up at grocer's stores, music stores. Um, fire stations are hosting a lot of these birds, like this eight-foot beast over here, which is perched right on top of this um, archway leading into the fire station. This is good work for Bellamy. He's making $40, $60 per eagle. But in the end, it's really just the opening gun in a mighty offensive to popularize another design which he had actually conceived back here when he was still working at the Charlestown Navy Yard. 
And that design is what we today know and revere as the Bellamy Eagle. Um, the Bellamy Eagle is one of the most sought after pieces of folk art in America. Um, Collectors will pay anywhere from $10,000 to $160,000 to own one of these. It's only about two feet in width, uh, made out of pine native to Maine. And it's only four pieces. You have the head and neck assembly right here, which connects to the main body via a single screw. Then you have the pole with the pike at the end, and then the banner. Um, the real genius of these birds, though, is the banner because you can make the, that banner say anything, and thus it can appeal to any number of sensibilities or, uh, or interests of your audience. By far, the most common of all Bellamy Eagles are these ones that say, don't give up the ship. If I had to do a rough estimate shooting from the hip, I'd say three out of every four birds he carved had that saying on them. I could be mistaken, maybe it was five out of every six, maybe it was two out of every three, who knows. But this is very common to find them, with the, and these are the most sought after by collectors today, strangely enough. Why is he putting that on there? Well, obviously, because that is what sells. By putting don't give up the ship on these banners, they're selling like hotcakes. But what does this mean, don't give up the ship? And this is where Constitution comes into play beautifully. Um, anybody recognize this boat? That's right, this is the Constitution as she appeared back in the last decades of the 19th century. She wasn't moored here at Charlestown. She was actually up at the Portsmouth Navy Yard where Bellamy was now working. Constitution was also, even at that time, a major tourist attraction. All your summer was not complete until you had gone down to see the Constitution. At the time, she was serving as, of all things, a floating barracks, a receiving ship, if you will. She had, so the main deck was housed over, you know, she'd been horribly beat up over the years. But everyone's going to see her. They're, they want to go ahead and they want to tour her. And at some point, someone had emblazoned on the side of the Constitution the words, don't give up the ship. See, all these tourists are coming there. They're seeing that saying. Later on, they're going ahead and they're going you know, window shopping in downtown Kittery or Portsmouth. Maybe they're back at the hotel. They go past the gift shop and they see these eagles that say, don't give up the ship. It's the perfect tourist memento, the perfect tchotchke, if you will, to commemorate your summer in the Portsmouth Kittery area. I like to think that Bellamy, well, given that he's only working on a project by project basis and he has all this extra time on his hands, I wonder if he may very well have actually been selling some of these eagles dockside at the Navy Yard, or maybe even on board her. We don't know. So you can see how the Constitution plays that role because uh, this was Bellamy's number one seller when it came to his eagles. And if it wasn't for that symbiotic relationship between him and the Constitution, uh, would we still be talking about him today? But it's not just about the Constitution. These birds can say, like I said, anything. A lot of them, of course, appear with um, slogans related to the U.S. Navy, like health to the Navy, or during the Spanish-American War, we see lots of ones that say, long live Dewey, remember the Maine. Um, they're great for any holiday. Merry Christmas. <laughs> happy New Year. <laughs> happy Thanksgiving. No happy Kwanzaa yet. But they're all out there. Uh, you do find that they're perfect for a holiday. Um, businesses use them to advertise uh, their, their, their work. Um, also, we find that Bellamy never stopped working for fraternal organizations. It's just rather than do all those gaudy frames and clock cases, now all he has to do is take his eagles he can put their slogans, their mottos, in the banner, like Dumb Vivimus Vivamus. Does anybody recognize that one? Any takers? Anybody know Latin? No? Well, Dumb Vivimus Vivamus means, while we live, let us live. And that is the, the motto of Harvard's super secret society, the Porcellian Club. So he's working for the Porcellians. He's also doing lots of eagles for, um, the, for of course, the Masons, uh, particularly their Knights Templar branch. The Lodge of the Red Men, which is a fraternal outfit that's still around today. Um, this one right here, which went missing for many a year, we recently found it. Um, Wentworth Lodge, Knights of Pythias. So you can just make those banners say anything, and they're perfect. To, it, a lot of them seem to have been displayed in the lodges, kind of like a mascot, but some seem to have been very taken home and using in your own home. And then there are some eagles that we have no idea what they're talking about. Like this one, Renum, what does that mean? 
n no one knows. Uh, it, it could be in an acronym, it could be an abbreviation as a period at the end. In Latin, renum is the word for kidney. <laughs> Fact is, we don't know, so your homework tonight, after you call everyone about Constitution, now you have to go ahead and ask folks what renum is, or at least hop online, something. We've got to figure this one out. Uh, and of course, like any good Victorian, we see lots of religious phrases and quotes from scripture also appearing on these birds. And uh, this is a great example of the fact that he's not just doing those two-foot eagle plaques. Bellamy is also carving these far more elaborate plaques from time to time. Um, there's a lot of mythology about these birds. Um, I wish, I, again, I had a nickel for every time someone told me that Bellamy, when he carved these birds, it was a very soulful experience. He was like Stradivarius at his workbench, working on a violin. He put his whole soul into these things. Or then there are the other tales that Bellamy used to carve these birds for purposes of barter. Uh, the story is that whenever he was feeling a little, shall we say, thirsty, he used to go ahead and sit down on a stump and take out his knife and whip up a few of these birds. And as soon as the paint dried, he'd tuck them under his arm. He'd march over the bridge from Kittery to Portsmouth, where he would proceed to go door to door, exchanging them for bottles of rum in all the grog shops over in Portsmouth. They're great stories, they're fun to tell around the campfire, but uh, in reality, to be horribly blunt, they're utter garbage. There's no truth to any of them. It's just the myths that have grown up over time. Um, if truth be told, these eagles were the bedrock of a very successful business uh, that he had going on for roughly 30 years. Uh, we have this priceless photograph right here of Bellamy's workshop. That's the workshop right here in the middle. Uh, let me see. If yeah, right, right here is this little two-story structure. That's the Pepperell Mansion you see right behind it over there on the left. But when it comes to Bellamy's workshop, um, in his business correspondences as well as his personal letters, Bellamy repeatedly refers to his workshop as, quote, a snug little factory. And it is a factory because he's not alone in there. He also has his father and his two younger brothers, Charles Jr. and Elisha, working in there. During periods of peak productivity, when they really have to make deadline, you'll also find some fellow Navy Yard workers in that shop um, working as apprentices. These guys are using nascent assembly line production methods, mechanical scroll saws to go ahead and do the basic cuts, um, using patterns to ensure uniformity of design. And after they're done filling an order, well then they go ahead and they, instead of tucking them under their arms and marching across the bridge to the, the, the bar rooms, they're actually packing them in crates, bringing them out here to the dock, and putting them aboard gundalows and sloops and schooners where they set sail to market. A lot of them are shipped, of course, right over the river to Portsmouth. Others, though, find their way down to New York City, uh, to the Manhattan Storage and Warehouse Company. And from there, they're distributed by rail anywhere in the country and by ship anywhere in the world. Uh, local lore in Kittery maintains that some of these birds were shipped as far away as the West Indies and Argentina. Uh, Bellamy's own nephew talks about some of his handiwork going all the way to the Far East. So this is anything but that romantic vision of the ignorant, itinerant woodcarver just doing these for simple barter. This is a very strong business. How many of these birds is Bellamy making? Well, we're talking several thousand. Um, we find in his records anywhere from orders of 200 to as many as 1,200 at a time are coming out of the shop. In the local papers, we have this little blurb that talks about how he just executed 500 effigies of this proud bird for Frank Jones, who was a businessman over in, um, over in Portsmouth. Um, among other things, he was a hotelier, a restaurateur, um, ran steamship and railroad lines, and he was also the brew king of Portsmouth. He ran the, uh, the largest brewery in town, which is probably where some of these myths about Bellamy carving them for bottles of rum come from. So these, uh, this, like I said, is just a, this factory is humming. In one letter to his dad, Bellamy recounts how in one weekend, the two of them made 100 eagles. That's two men alone in that workshop can go ahead and bang out these birdies. Um, they're making so many of these darn eagles that we forget today that there's other elements to Bellamy's life story and his career. Um, at the same time as he's making the birds, remember he is working still for the Navy, and he's also working as a house carpenter. He does lots of decorative interior wood carvings, um, like this paneling and shell cupboards that we see here for 
a home in Kittery uh, called Sparhawk Hall. He actually worked on this project side by side with his father. It's uh, believed now to be the first conscious effort to restore a colonial era home to its original appearance. Uh, the paneling in the middle here, all this was done by Bellamy's dad. Uh, the shell cover that we see over here on the, I'm forgetting which one, it's the left one, right? Oh, yeah, it's the left one. This right here is Bellamy's handiwork. This one right here is original to the 1700s. And when you actually look at them, Bellamy's is superior to the one he's copying. So, um, we also find he's doing lots of decorative exterior wood carvings, like these um, pine laurel wreaths frame that you find over the, uh, or in the portico of the Governor Goodwin Mansion over in Portsmouth. Uh, he does furniture, uh, including this trunk right here, which is the last recorded, recorded wood carving by Bellamy. Uh, he was carving this in 1912, just two years before he died. Unfortunately, he never got to finish it. It was a gift to his nephew, uh, Moses Victor Safford. And uh, never, Moses never even knew that he was working on this. He never got, to, to, never got the trunk before Bellamy's passing. And then, of course, like any good wood carver, there are all kinds of works of whimsy, strange little items that Bellamy does for his own amusement or enjoyment or use around the house, like this little bust here of a dog, maybe it was a family pet. And now Bellamy is more than a woodcarver, he's also a poet. Um, lots of his poems are published in local papers or in these colorful handbills. Uh, we don't know exactly how these were distributed, at least not yet. And his uh, poetry is a great window into the fact that Bellamy was friends with many of the leading literati of the late 19th century. Just some of his close personal friends include authors like William Dean Howells of the Atlantic Monthly, Marion Crawford, Mark Twain. Uh, we also see uh, artists like Winslow Homer and George Savary Wasson are hanging out in his workshop. He's friends with Charles Eliot, president of Harvard College, the Honorable Hamlin Hamlin, former vice president of the United States. These are just some of the folks that are, going work, that are hanging out in his workshop during the summer months. It seems they originally came to the area on vacation. Um, they came, some of these guys, like Mark Twain, probably looking for a local color, uh, maybe a new character or two for a piece they're working on. And before you know it, Bellamy's workshop becomes an impromptu gentleman's club. These guys are hanging out in there. They're chewing the fat, smoking cigars, quaffing the occasional beverage. And they're also piling into Bellamy's yacht and careening around the harbor. So, like I said, anything, he's anything but just a simple woodcarver. Unfortunately, at the dawn of the 20th century, the years are catching up to Bellamy. By the time uh, this photo was taken, uh, this is the last known photo of Bellamy at his, at his workbench, um, he's just a spent shell of a man. His hands are gnarled with arthritis. Uh, most of his friends at this point have either died or moved away. He's the last surviving member of his family. All of his brothers and sisters have already died. And remember, he's the oldest, so the firstborn is the last to go. Um, by 1911, um, he is declared legally incompetent and is removed from the Pepperell Mansion. Where he, so now he's spending his last few years in exile over in Portsmouth under the care of some cousins of his who proceed to bleed him dry of his finances. Until finally, perhaps mercifully, Bellamy gives up the ship on April 5th, 1914. Funny thing though is that unlike most artists that require a century or more to pass before we uh, discover, rediscover their work, it only took 20 years for Bellamy's rediscovery to unfold. Um, in just two decades after his passing, major museums and collectors around the country are buying up his work. Carvings that originally sold for as little as one to two dollars are now selling for several hundred. Today, those same carvings sell for several thousand dollars while larger, more exquisite pieces will easily bring oh, up to six figures at auction. And um, if we ever have a uh, real economic recovery, like kind of like we did back in the 80s and the 90s, uh, I'd like to believe that we probably will see the day when a Bellamy carving brings over a million dollars at auction. Um, maybe uh, I'm mistaken there, some people call me a dreamer, but I know I'm not the only one. No. So I had to put that in. I do think we will see that happen though, with a little bit of luck. Um, when Bellamy was, um, after he dies in 1914, local papers, when they eulogize him, they write him up in the obituaries, uh, we see repeatedly that they were stating that no other man from this area will be as long remembered or celebrated as Bellamy. 
And it seems that uh, they were right because, well, here we are, 100 years later, and we're still talking about the man here today. So that does it for me. Uh, at this point, uh, I'd like to open up the floor to any questions that you may have or comments, concerns. No? Questions about life in general? <laughs> Mark. What, what, what did, did they know anything about his production techniques? Because to crank out, I mean, I'm a woodworker too, and I know that to crank out that quantity, you've got to have some machinery. That's right. When it comes down, let me, let me pull up one of these birdies here. So, yeah, here we go. Uh, let's go back to our favorite. Okay, when it comes down to a bell and eagle, how are they producing these? How are they getting them done so quick? Well, it's not a true assembly line that hasn't been invented yet. What they're doing is a division of labor. Um, they're taking blocks of wood. They're using patterns to go ahead and to mark out in pencil where the basic cuts are going to be. That's the first thing the apprentices are doing. So the apprentices are using mechanical scroll saws to go ahead and to make those basic cuts. After those cuts are made, in uh, giving definition and form to the pieces, Bellamy and, believe it or not, his father and brothers are getting involved. They are using hand tools. Uh, when you look at Bell, I've had the good fortune now to twice have Bellamy's oh, work chest open, opened up in front of me. You got to study all of the, the tools with wood carvers who do replica work of Bellamy today. And so, the, and which was just wonderful because they're explaining to me what each tool does because I am not a wood carver. And what, what, they, what they were able to infer from looking at the tool chest was number one, they're sharing tools. We actually have tools stamped by, with John's name on them, his father and his younger brother, Elisha. So it's all in there together. They're making the cuts by hand. So all the fine defining work, such as the, um, all the, the cuts for the feathering, the eye, the beak, especially the tongue, which is um, very fragile, all that stuff is being done by hand. After that, uh, the apprentices again step in. They're slapping the paint on them. They're assembling the birds. The final bit right here seems to overwhelmingly be done by Bellamy. Uh, Bellamy did study penmanship for two years at the New Hampton Institute. So it seems that he has gained quite a facility with calligraphy. Most of these banners are in his hand. We do find instances, though, where, again, it's not his hand. Uh, where a, another artist uh, had to step, I shouldn't say, woodcarver had to step in to go ahead and, and do that work. Local Lauren Kittery maintains that a local lady from time to time uh, came in to go ahead and to help out with some of the painting and the gilding. So that is what we know uh, at present about how the workshop was functioning. There's only, there are only two photos of the, of the workshop itself. Both feature Bellamy's bench. One of them, like you saw, which you saw, has him at the end of his life, and most of the tools are off the bench now. It's pretty much empty. Just a lot of books and papers stacked up there. Here, we don't get too many clues from the photographic evidence. Most of it actually comes from the letters and comes from what we know um, from analyzing the, the eagles themselves. You can actually see the, the marks from the scroll saws, and you can also see the different types of tools. Using a V tool to make most of the basic cuts uh, for the feathering, but on occasion, they actually get in there with a knife, and you will find that they are just, if you look at them with a microscope, that there is some whittling going on um, from time to time. So these guys are working fast. It's an easy design. It's a very simple design, which I think is what really enables them as well to go ahead and produce so many so quickly. But don't have the full answer yet, because they didn't, they didn't go ahead and take photos of the entire sh shop, unfortunately. So does that answer your question, or does it give you some idea at least? I mean, it's still, it's a feat of work. Um, you can see why folks have said it took them a, a, a day to a week to make each bird. Uh, you would think that because, well, if you didn't know any better, if you didn't read the papers, if you didn't go ahead and really analyze them with a microscope, you wouldn't be able to infer all that information. So, yes, ma'am. You mentioned he went with his cousins at the end. Did he ever marry his own for having children? Ah, <laughs> I'm so glad you asked that question. <laughs> Um, Bellamy never married. Um, the story that we're told by his nephew and his first biographer, uh, Moses Victor Safford, is that John was, um, he was in love with a local Kittery girl. And he was courting her uh, while he, at the end of his tenure with Dockham, around 1857. So he's courting this gal, but unfortunately he's living in Portsmouth at the time. So most of that courtship takes place via 
ma the mail. So he's sending off love letters and love poems. But eventually the time comes when he falls down on bended knee and he looks up in her eyes and says, Darling, will you marry me? And she says, no. She rejects him outright. And that really puts him off the deep end. He never, ma he never goes back into the, the, the matrimonial waters or tries to get married. Um, the, the story is that he was involved in a love triangle. And she, wasn't, uh, she was also being courted by an uh, a, a, a aspiring lawyer in, Ports, in the Portsmouth Kittery area. And that um, one bit version of the, the, the story is that she chooses the, the, the soon-to-be lawyer over the soon-to-be woodcarver. I wonder why, you know, a little bit of a gold digger maybe. Uh, another story, another version of the story says that um, she doesn't choose either man and that it just ends badly for everyone. Um, very interestingly though, no record of what her name was. So she's kind of a mystery, but he was loath to talk about it. Um, but that really, it, it's, um, it, it sent him off the deep end. Actually, it's one of the, it's where we get the legend of Bellamy. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but Bellamy, again, a lot of legends about him being kind of this two-fisted brawling drinker. He used to go ahead and like, you know, go off on these benders and wake up in people's yards and didn't know where he was. Uh, a lot of that comes from this time because he turns the bottle for solace. Um, but it's a temporary phase and one which he's able to go ahead and overcome. But, and, and it gets really strange when you think about like that poem you saw, Little Wife. He writes lots of poems about marriage and about couples and being together. And, but yet he himself, you know, it never happened. So no kids. Nah. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. So we long for that, but uh, where are these love letters discovered? And if so, no. Well, number one, they're being sent to this gal. We don't even know what her name is. So. Yeah, I'd like to think there's some repository somewhere where the letters of Madam X can be found and we could find who this gal was, but uh, we, we don't have anything from her. The only thing we have um, to verify the, uh, the, the legend, the account, besides Bellamy's behavior and family letters talking about this, are receipts for room and board from when he was in Portsmouth. Uh, his nephew, who knew him personally, Moses Victor Safford, grew up, he was the closest thing Bellamy had to his son. Um, Moses used to, he, he talks intimately about many parts of Bellamy's life and he's the one who breaks the story about uh, the love affair and what happened. Um, but that's, that's all we have, unfortunately. Um, no, no love letters have turned up yet uh, concerning her. So this um, assembly line um, processing, does this come from his origin uh, in Charlestown with Tidcombe and brought that to uh, and uh, furthermore, did he have the marketing finesse to actually paint to give up the ship uh, on the Constitution himself? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent questions. Um, when it comes down to um, where he, he gains this knowledge, it's twofold. Part of it is from working for the Navy itself. And the, the Navy, especially during the Civil War, here at Charlestown, they had a lot of ships to go ahead and convert from civilian use to military use. Um, captured vessels, as well as building uh, warships and repairing existing ones. So they're using a lot of the most up-to-date technologies they can get their hands on. So Bellamy, uh, of course, is, you know, he's observing this, he's picking up on it, and he's learning from his, so he's applying the lessons he's learned here at the Navy Yard to uh, his commercial ventures outside. We find that when it, that's where he first runs a workshop and he is using, excuse me, those same assembly line production methods. In his own letters, we find that um, he testifies to the presence of other apprentices in the workshop working for him. Uh, he talks about how one night, how, Dad, I'd really love to come home tonight, but unfortunately, I have these two guys working on models that they just don't understand. So I gotta, I gotta stay late, I gotta make sure these guys know what they're doing. Uh, we also find that his younger brother, Elisha, comes down to work at the shop. And after John, actually this is around the time John goes back, Charles is working in the workshop as well. So just like what we see up in, um, in Kittery, the same thing's unfolding here. Um, they're learning, they're using patterns, they're using scroll saws, and they're really churning it out. And what's really fun is when you actually take all the Masonic uh, frames and, and clock cases or shelves and you put them together, it's so easy to see who was working on what. 
because the, the, the designs change ever so subtly. Like, okay, you can see Bellamy was working on the wings, that, uh, but, but this guy over here on, on the same frame design, you know, the, 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 the portico and the, the pediments, this is all different. Or, oh, this G, this is Bellamy's work, but if you look at the compass, this isn't his. These guys are working on each individual piece, and then they're being assembled at the end. Or they're going ahead and they're, it's one piece of wood, one guy's working on the G, move it along to the next guy, he works on the, uh, the compass, next guy works on this part, the pediment, and they just keep going down the line. So do you feel that there was an efficiency achieved, and so at some point Eagles had left the shop without Bellamy's hand touching them? Excellent question. I mean, and this gets to the real heart of when it comes to a Bellamy Eagle now. Oh, I mean, when, let me see if I can pull up one of the birds again. Da, 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 da. Uh, uh, okay. When it comes to a Bellamy Eagle, how much did John do? Like, we had this notion uh, in the previous scholarship on Bellamy uh, that he was like, he, it's, he's a one man show. He's just this itinerant or, you know, wood carver on a stump, whittling them with a knife. And that seems to have actually been instrumental in driving up the prices because folks love that story. And now we're confronted with the fact that that's not the case at all. This is a business. This is, a, this is like, uh, it's, it's like something you find in the gift shop uh, here at Constitu It's a tourist memento. You know, it's, it's kind of like a keychain or something uh, for the 19th century. So the question is, uh, are these really worth it now? Should we really be investing in them? I'm going to say yes, first of all, because most of this is Bellamy's handiwork. Sure, he didn't do the basic cuts probably when it came to that. That's, that's the apprentices. The paint job, you know, that's something, you know, store-bought paint they're slapping on. But this overwhelmingly is Bellamy's handiwork when it comes to the paint. And I find, I'm, I'm going to say 85% of these birds, Bellamy's hand is present when it comes to cutting the feathers, cutting the eye, cutting all, all those defining details that make a Bellamy eagle a Bellamy eagle. Um, each piece has to be looked at independently. Um, some of them, I see nothing but Bellamy's hand in them. Others, absolutely. Yeah, I can look at that and be like, yeah, that's really not John. I mean, there, that one that I had up there, Long Life Bitters, when I look at that head, that's not John's work. That's you know, something that he would only have entrusted to his father or his brothers. So you have to look at each one independently now. I don't think it, I mean, personally, I don't think it goes ahead and detracts from the value of these. First of all, these birds are a watershed moment in American fine art or folk art. You can classify them either way. The point is, these birds are a, are a departure. If you looked at those birds by Laban Beecher, we looked at a few minutes ago, that's far more common for the 19th century. Everybody's trying to capture the eagle with photographic realism and precision. They're trying to capture every feather on the bird, every crease, every fold. And in the process, well, I have to bring that photo back. I mean, they're going ahead and they're making these birds that just don't look like birds after a while. Um, I mean, I mean, look at this thing. It looks more like a vulture than an eagle. <laughs> I mean, this, this thing, I mean, I, I, personally, I love it, but it's kind of hideous at the same time. <laughs> and this is by one of the better woodcarvers of the 19th century. See, that's what happens when you go for photographic realism and precision on one of these birds. I mean, he's try every bit of plumage, every crease on the talons. It just looks silly. As for what Bellamy's doing, though, You know, when Bellamy makes his birds, this isn't photographic at all. This is actually style, it's representational. But in the process, there's no question about what you're looking at. You are looking at, a, at an eagle. It's a, by streamlining it, by minimizing it, by cutting it down to its most basic components, you know, he makes a, a work of art that is far more expressive. It captures the essence of America. I mean, you get the optimism you know, from the, the way the head is arching upwards. You have the fierceness in the eye and the beak. The sense, I mean, this thing looks like it's flying. Look at that darn thing. I mean, this, this, this looks like it's, a, like it's a bullet train. You get this real sense of movement in there. And, and so what we're seeing is we're seeing the very beginnings of 
those abstract expressionistic art forms that are going to appear in the coming century. Bellamy, I, I liken him, he's the John the Baptist of American art. He's really one of the first artists of any medium that we see in the 19th century that's really embracing this and running with it and having some great commercial success with it. He's not the only one, of course, there are others, but he's one of the first. And so that right there, like I said, it's a milestone. It's a watershed moment. And most of what you're seeing in these birds is Bellamy's handiwork, and it's certainly his design. As far as the script uh, that you've seen, mm -hmm. where have you seen the variances where it's reported to be this, this gal that would come in and uh, possibly paint or possibly script some of these banners? Um, given all the eagles that you have seen, mm -hmm. uh, where are the variances that would not be, would be a telltale that is not in Bellamy's hand? Um, well, there aren't that many. Um, we did have one that we saw here tonight. This one right here, Dum Vivimus Pavamus. Um, you notice that it just it lacks a lot of the life that you find in, in a Bellamy uh, bird. I, if, uh, let's see, where's one link? You'll notice um, just there's a little more going on in these letters and the way with which uh, he highlights them with the red behind there. Much flatter, much simpler. Um, this I've seen uh, happening not only on this piece, but also on another one, In Hoc Signo Vinces, which again was for, of all things, a fraternal outfit. That's a Masonic uh, carving that he did. And then there's one which um, is just absolutely wild. And this is one that I wonder if it is the handiwork of, um, I'm going to bring this one up for you, because this, this is a fun one. Um, can you tell I have a lot of Bellamy photos in here? <laughs> Now I have to go find one of them. Okay, this is... Dun, 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 dun. It will appear, I swear. Um, where are you? Because this will give you a great idea of something that is obviously not Bellamy's hand. <laughs> Come on. We should have some Muzak in the background. Yeah. <laughs> you have to work on that for the next talk. Uh, come on. I know you're in here. You're hiding. Well, actually, I'll pull this one up first while the computer warms up. This is another one where the script, again, just doesn't match. Um, so this is probably you know, one of his apprentices, maybe one of his brothers. Go ahead and crafting that. Um, it's just very simple, very basic and flat. And like I said, this is a Masonic carving, actually, of all things. And then, do do do. Where are you hiding? You have to see this. Ah, here we go. So right here, obviously not Bellamy's script at all. And again, strangely enough, this piece, Masonic. Faith, hope, and charity is another one of these sayings or expressions that we find in Masonic artwork um, and used in the lodge. So when it comes down to these birds, for some reason he's not touching them. He's not doing that. Um, and then there is one other piece, which I don't have a photo of, um, which says anti-Volstead on it, as in anti-Volstead act. What's great about that one is the Volstead act came about after Bellamy's dead. What happens sometimes is people reuse these birds. They'll scrape, uh, they'll, they'll go ahead and they'll clean off the original paint and they'll put their own saying on there. So that does happen now and then. Um, especially because the, the original treatment, very thin. If you're not careful using some solvents to clean these, you'll take that script right off of the banner. So it happens very easily, Steve. Um, so, so in the neck of that bird, it seems to be more stout. Is this yeah. a, an earlier uh, iteration or something later? Or again, a premise touching uh, the, the bird? Uh, See, you come up with the best questions. I'm glad you're here tonight. Um, when it comes down to this bird, it, why do we have the, I call these no-neck Joes. I used to think that these were actually knockoffs, that these weren't actual Bellamy's. Um, they do come out of his workshop. Um, this one is in Bellamy's hand, um, when it comes to the feathering especially. Um, as to why the neck is so short, I, at first I thought it was an earlier version. It's not. This, uh, this one actually here has a date on it from 1883, so at the height of his production, he's coming out with this. Um, one of the prevailing theories right now is that the reason for the short neck is because it's scrap stock. He's so, you know, he's just trying to get these out, so he's just taking any old piece of wood 
And uh, unfortunately, he can't get the full graceful neck effect that he usually does. And so this one just ends up going out the door. I don't know if I quite believe that, though. That's what some of my woodcarver friends have said. But you'll notice the eye is very different. It's more elongated than we usually find. And the beak is much softer. It's a realistic beak. Uh, my guess is that we're looking at the work of one of those apprentices. Probably, uh, it, for, in particular, it probably would have been his father or one of his brothers. I can't imagine him trusting this work to just some average schmo he hired part-time you know, from the Navy Yard just to go ahead and fill in one of the gaps. Um, but, so you do find variations within there. That's one of the beauties, though, is that Bellamy's hand is very precise, um, very exact. Um, he's doing most as he's eyeballing it. Um, single strokes, very bold, very, very um, confident work. And when you come to a copyist or someone who's going ahead, and, and like one of the apprentices, you'll find that there are mistakes in there, or you'll find that the hand is less accomplished. And one of the mistakes in here is there should be another little cut right under the eye to give more definition to the eyelid. It's missing. So. Um, you have to look for those little things. Each one of these birds has to be looked at on its own merits. You can't just go ahead and, I mean, we can definitely say, yep, from the, 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 the workshop of John Haley Bellamy, but to determine how much of the piece is Bellamy, that's where you have to really go ahead and get in there and scrutinize. Any other questions, comments, no? Is, is there an estimate on how many of this type of eagle were made? <laughs> thousands. I'm going to say tens of thousands. Tens of thousands. Uh, and again, why don't we see more of them becomes the question. Well, you have to realize most of these birds, this is a disposable art form, just like a ship's figurehead or a stern board. These birds, most folks who bought them, they hung them outdoors. Uh, you'll actually see like, where instead of using the wire on the back, people will usually drive a nail in here and a nail in there or a nail down in the bottom. And so uh, there's a collector up in Elliott, Maine, who showed me this wonderful piece. It's a fragment. All that's left is where it, the, the head neck assembly meets the shield. Everything else had just disintegrated over time. People are just nailing them up there on the wall, uh, above a barn door or right over their own front door. Um, we actually have pictures of people with Bellamy Eagles over their front doors. There is a house, even today, in Marblehead, Massachusetts, that has a Bellamy Eagle over its front door. I don't think they know what they have, to be honest with you. Um, it has some, some crappy shellac on it, so they're trying to weatherproof it. Probably during the bicentennial, someone took it out and said, hey, well, why don't we put this out here? Everyone's like real rah, 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 patriotic, and it's been there ever since. Um, a lot of these pieces also, you have to remember, they're being shipped abroad. Who knows what happened to the ones that go to Argentina? Um, and. Um, I'm sure a lot of these pieces also, they just got, you know, as they deteriorated, got thrown in the fire. Just like, oh, look, you know, we need some kindling here. You know, it's a nice cold winter night. So it's a disposable art form. Um, folks just don't appreciate these things. They still turn up in the darndest places. I mean, there's a house on Monhegan Island where um, the fo it's, it's just been there for forever in this old fisherman's shed. Um, they, they just, it's, it's just like, like well, during your last trip to Aruba, do you remember? Do you, did you preserve your your keychain or your your little like you know snow globe that you brought back? <laughs> of course not. So look at this as a 19th century snow globe made by one of the greatest wood carvers and marketeers you could ever imagine. That's kind of how we. Sh I, not that I want to drive down value on these things because I don't think they should be driven down, but it's just this is what we're looking at. Um, so folks aren't going to appreciate them as much as they should have back when they bought them. Yeah. Is that it? Well, thanks again for coming out today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you.